Hi. So thank you for having me on, by the way. Yeah, welcome. No problem. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, welcome to the podcast. It's weird. It's like a, it's like welcoming somebody to a place or something, but it's <laughs> yeah. a virtual place. Yeah, yeah. It's a little different right now where uh, everybody's social distancing, but indeed, I would have preferred life to always have social distancing <laughs> prior yeah. to this. Yeah, there's definitely some good things that have been brought about by the pandemic. <laughs> like, I like wearing a mask and uh, you know the grocery store now. I don't have a problem with that at all. I don't think we need to stop doing that. Yeah, I mean, especially with all the facial recognition stuff yeah. around and everything yeah. else. Like, yeah. can we always wear masks? I think that'd be nice. It's not really, a, it's not really that uh, terrible of a development. No, that's <laughs> no, not. So yeah, you're a, a former independent congressional candidate for California's 39th district. Um, yeah, for, former, but uh, uh, soon to be again, you know? Okay, you're another crack at it. Yeah, I, I'm going to keep going until I win. That's the plan. Good. I like that spirit. I like that, yeah. uh, that motivation. I wish we had more people that were just just bound and determined to kind of break down the barriers and, and get regular people into Congress. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a rough thing because well, I mean, my background is I was a motocross racer growing up, and I'm always like ever since I was even a little kid, I was very very competitive. So like even playing like board games with my family, if I lost, I'd be pissed off, you know, like flip the Monopoly board over and like you know be angry. So. Um, I'm already that kind of guy, but, but ultimately um, I just don't see very many people. I believe, you know, this could sound hubristic or whatever. I believe I actually understand what's going on and what needs to get done to fix it. And I don't see anybody else trying to do it. So uh, I don't have a choice. (laughs) I have to keep going. Can you tell us a little bit about the, your opponents in the race and who ended up winning? Well, right now it's, um, it's, there are a lot of these actually, but um, it's just a rematch from 2018, which um, that's the two that are left are uh, young Kim, who's a Republican. She's the challenger. She was handpicked by the previous Republican. So up to 2018 in this district, Ed Royce was the guy. And it was like 25 years of him being, you know, the congressperson. And then um, he handpicked young Kim, who's a woman, a Korean born woman who worked with him. And, you know, he's as corrupt as the day is long, obviously. But um, and then so she, you know, one would assume also is. uh, But um, and then uh, in 2018, essentially, uh, Gil Cisneros was assigned the district by the DNC. He flew back in early 2017 after Trump won and like met with all the DNC people like the and the DCCC and and gave him a bunch of money because he's a lottery winner. He won like two hundred and sixty six million dollars in the lottery. Wow. Um, that's, so, a, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So he's he was giving them a bunch of money and then they more or less he ha, I mean, he, he's from Newport Beach. That's where he's lived since he won the lottery. But he, uh, um, you know, bought a house in Yorba Linda, which is in the district and sort of just, uh, you know, played the role. He spent like eleven million dollars with his own money to win the first time. Um, and then, um, now, now it's him and, uh, young Kim again, and she almost beat him last time, but, um, we'll see how that, that goes. sounds almost like a bad screenplay. Like a guy wins the lottery and moves to self finances campaign, spends $11 million to like fulfill the dream of becoming an oligarch of the American dream, right? I guess, you know, like, it's, like, it's you, you're exactly like, a, like that too. You're like fulfilling a fantasy of everything that like all, you and all your like former coworkers talk shit about when you were actually like on the clock. Yeah, a hundred percent. And the thing is, is like his whole thing. And I, like I was, cause I ran in 2018 too. I got my ass kicked way worse um, in 2018, but like um, I was in like a half a dozen or more candidate forums with Gil and um, you know, he's not a very bright guy first off, but, but it's also pretty, pretty, uh, um, pretty obvious that he was trying to join the club. You know, he wanted to just, basically it's like, you know, he had two newborn kids at home. Uh, I think, you know what i'm not going to speculate his personal life but him and his wife they had a couple couple newborns and then um he just decided he's got to join you know he was a republican up until like 2010 and then um and then he decided he's gonna he's gonna um, join the club and be in the club you know he, his first he said he was gonna vote again like he said that uh, nancy pelosi shouldn't be speaker of the house if he's elected that he wouldn't vote for her. but his very first vote was for nancy pelosi for speaker of the house yeah. and then he has voted with her 100 percent of the time since then like 100 percent, he's voted with nancy pelosi so i'm just like okay buddy you know like why spend all this money just to do exactly what you're told like to be a lap dog for these people like if I would have won that money, I know like straight up 
I probably would have tried to win. I wouldn't have spent that much money because I think you only need to spend that kind of money if you're if you're unlikable. <laughs> but but uh, uh, I would have you know tried to start a poor person's lobby, like a lobbyist organization that works for poor people to try and get healthcare done and a bunch of other stuff that helps regular people. You know to fight the oligarchs at their own game, start paying off Congress people to help to help the poor. Yeah, you know he could have easily done that with that kind of money. So yeah, you've run as a basically a proud independent, and you've obviously kept your or uh, made your opposition to both major major parties a key uh, element of your platform, your strategy, kind of um, one of your main uh, values you run on. Uh, what has it been like running from outside of the two party system, and uh, why do you think people keep voting for corporate Republicans and Democratic candidates despite there being better options on the ballot uh, running as independents, people like yourself? Well, I think uh, fear fear is a great motivator. Um, and, and both parties, that's what they do. They, they get people afraid, you know, um, it's fearing, fearing orange man or, or fearing illegals or fearing, um, you know, guns or fearing gays or, you know, whatever. Like they, the point is, is there's always something that they can use to now it's Antifa, right? Oh, Antifa, Antifa yeah. is, a, you know, the, so, but there's always something they can use to divide us. And it's like the oldest, oldest trick in the book, you know, the oldest political strategy in the book is divide and conquer so that the people at the top, they keep us all fighting each other. And then they just, you know, they own both the parties. So it doesn't really matter to them, which one's in charge, you know, they're going to get their way. So, um, you know, but, but it's just a lot of fear, but, but, you know, I got to say it has, I, if it didn't go a certain way the first time, so I got my butt kicked the first time, but I really didn't know what I was doing. I still didn't most of the time in the second one, I figured it out right at the end, but it was a little too late. Like, I think I did. I will find out in 2022. <laughs> but but uh, um, with all this, uh, even in the first one, when I got my butt kicked, every time I would knock on somebody's door, um, and I never liked it because I am a natural introvert. I like to be home. I don't want to, like, bother people. <laughs> I just, you know. So, but I'd knock on the door. They would answer. I'd say, hi, I'm Steve Cox. I'm running for Congress here. And they would immediately fold their arms up like this and go, which party? And I go, I'm an, I'm an independent. And almost 100% of the time, they go, oh, like this. And then they want to talk. They're like, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And that, to me, is a powerful thing if I can just figure out how to properly harness it. Um, I think that there's a lot of power there. Um, and, and to properly motiv motivate people to show up and vote for me instead of for the lesser evil or, or you know, to try and prevent the bad party, whichever one they consider that to be from winning. Um, but there's a lot of power there because, um, even most, I mean, every, every conservative I talk to every single one of them, um, whether they be right wing libertarian types or, or Republicans, um, they all know that the system is screwed and they want something better. They want something different on the left side. If you want to call it that the less right side, and then the actual left side, uh, where the Democrats and then the progressives and wherever those people go. Um, the liberals are the hardest ones uh, to get through to, um, even face to face. They're very difficult. They, it's like, well, you're not a Democrat. And I'm like, no, I'm not a Democrat. They're like, why aren't you a Democrat? And I'm like, because I don't want to be a Democrat. Why don't you want to be a Democrat? And I'm like, because screw Democrats. I, like the party sucks. I, I don't, you know, the people are fine. Like the regular people down at the regular level, most of them are perfectly fine. But you know, I don't want to join some crappy club, you know, it's not, it's not something I, I would look forward to. Doing. Yeah. Speaking of a crappy uh, club and the sort of dynamic of Faustian politics, uh, what do you think of yeah. the general election with uh, presidential candidates? What do you make of the, you know, fear mongering that, you know, there is no moral vote that is for anybody besides Joe Biden. Any criticism of Joe Biden made public is, uh, you know, just fanning the fires of Donald Trump and putting wind in sails to reelection as, um, 10 points in the national, um, uh, you know, election polling and, you know, just, you know, having a terrible time of re-election. Uh, what, what do you make, how do you make sense of all that? And, and what do you think about it? I think, uh, I think I have a pretty good handle on this, actually. Um, I think that what's really going on is, I mean, it, it's obviously a, a shell game. So they're like, you know, switch, your switch, your switch, switch, you know, so that it's a shell game. But what they're trying to do is like like if they wanted to just beat donald trump they would have nominated bernie sanders if that was their only goal they would have nominated bernie sanders bernie sanders easily would have beat donald trump um but 
that's not their actual goal. And it, you know, the proof is in the pudding on that. So they've taken a two time loser and, and, um, and Joe Biden and, you know, hit him away so that people aren't aware of his obvious uh, cognitive decline and, and all the other problems that he's going through. And, and I mean, every time they let him out, he says something stupid about shooting unarmed people. Hey, police should shoot unarmed people in the leg instead of in the chest. You're like, Oh, how about we don't shoot them? I don't know. Maybe, maybe don't shoot them. Like, I don't, I don't know if maybe that's a better idea. Um, you know, or like doing the kneel down thing in front of that church full of black people. That's like a black church and he's wearing a basket kneeling in front of all of them. I'm just like, Jesus. like, yeah, but you know, the bottom line is, is the, the Democratic Party, and I'm, I'm 100% convinced of this, would much rather lose to Donald Trump than let somebody like Bernie Sanders win because he cuts off a lot of their uh, special interest money and they need that money, or at least they believe they do, um, to, to pay the bills, you know, to survive, to pay near Tandon and all these other useless assholes. <laughs> yeah. So where does that leave you in November then? Uh, how do you feel about other third parties in the general election? Have you paid any attention to like the yeah. Howie Hawkins candidacy or anything like that? I mean, the bottom line for me is I'm a pro gun lefty, you know, like, I, you know, I align left, but I'm, I'm, you know, I explain this. The easiest way to explain this is that I believe in people. And I think you have to, and if you're going to have a, a government that's by, for, and of the people, um, you have to believe that the people can make good decisions and, and run, you know, effectively run their government if they're given the right information. If they're given the good information, you have to believe that they can, that the people themselves, the body public, can, can actually uh, handle that job, you know, because that's how this country is supposed to run, um, in theory. And it's, it's not how it runs, but that's how it's supposed to run. And um, so, you know, on that end, like, I end up aligning with libertarians, and by that I mean the right-wing libertarians, on most social issues because they're very government hands off on all those things because you have to believe in the people. I, I'm, I'm government hands off as, as much as possible with guns, with drugs, with, with immigration, you know, to be smart, but, but, you know, let people do what they want to do. Let them make decisions for themselves. Um, but as such, I run into a conundrum picking presidential candidates because I have a, a, on one hand, obviously climate change is a major problem and everything else. And I'd like to help the green party, um, get up in there. But uh, I'm at odds with the Green Party when it comes to guns and <laughs> a few things like that. So, uh, you know, I, it's kind of a person by person thing. Um, I probably would have voted for uh, Jesse Ventura if he would have got in. Um, <laughs> but um, at this point, I'll probably just pick whichever third party candidate is polling the highest to try and get somebody up to the 5%, you know, yeah, that's, that's been our that's thinking it. along the lines as well. Yes, yeah, kind of, you know, having some candidate reach the 5%. I mean, unless it's somebody who's totally abysmal, obviously, I would, yeah. you know, rather halt that. Yeah, but I mean, as, as bad as, as the Libertarian Party is, the party, you know, because they're a right-wing party, as bad as they are on economic stuff, because they're horrible, they're really, really bad at it, their social stuff is pretty good. It's really, really close. You know, they're, they're against the police state. They're against the, you know, mass incarceration. They're against the war on drugs. That You know, there's a lot of stuff. What would the libertarian align. response be to something like the COVID pandemic? Because that was kind of the running joke, right? The yeah. Atlantic had that piece. It was like, you know, the, there's no such thing as a libertarian um, in a pandemic. Um, you know, uh, I, I ran my own response to that, uh, full disclosure. Uh, you know, uh, what, what's your thinking of how the libertarians would, uh, would respond to that if in power? Well, I think um, Justin Amash, who's supposedly a libertarian, he is the only, well, one of a, only a, few, a handful, less than a handful of people in Congress who flat out said we need to give $2,000 a month of the universal basic income to everybody so that uh, everybody can just, you know, decide how they use that money but make sure that people are whole and, and just give them the money. It's all the Democrats that are always like, well, we have to tie it to employment and we have to tie it to this and we got to have means testing. But, but Amash's position is, and I understand it to, to a certain extent, I get the logic of it, whether I agree wholly with what he's saying or not, I get the logic. He's saying, why waste all the money on the bureaucracy? Just give the money to the people and they'll figure it out. Like they'll, they'll, they'll buy from the people they're going to buy from. And they'll help keep all these companies whole instead of bailing out all these big, big companies and everything else, you know, give the people money and then they'll, they'll bail out the companies essentially. Right. So, I mean, I think he's pretty close on that, honestly, on the financial side. Um, 
I, I don't necessarily agree with the rationale why, but I, but I think the, he got the answer right. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to pivot just a little bit and talk yeah. about some of the interesting kind of like policy proposals that you were your campaign it was kind of offering. And yeah. I, I thought it was uni unique because typically outsider candidates beat the drum of, you know, Medicare for all, Green New Deal. Um, and while you talked a lot about, you know, the need for health care and the need yeah. to combat climate change, uh, you also introduced a lot of policies that were pretty uniquely your own. Uh, two policies that stood out to me uh, were your proposal to cut congressional pay to reflect the median income of your district, uh, something yeah, that you that. said that you were willing to do uh, the day you went, walked into office. Yep. And uh, you also proposed eliminating income tax forever uh, for people who serve in the military. Uh, could you talk about those two proposals a bit and why we uh, should adopt them? Uh, uh, well, the well, to be clear on the military one, um, the, the exact wording is people who served in combat. Oh, war um, veterans, sorry. War veterans. So, so my thing is, is um, my dad served uh, in Vietnam in the U.S. Marine Corps. And, um, you know, he, he came home more or less wholly out of destroyed knee, but otherwise he was, he was okay. But he, he, he still wasn't whole, you know what I mean? Like, uh, you go to war and, and the way that war affects people, um, nobody comes back from that like they left, you know what I mean? And so, um, I just, it always stuck in my craw whenever the government, like whenever he would get in tax trouble or something like that, and he would be like scrambling to get his taxes paid. And I, you know, even when I was young, I'm like, man, that sucks. Like you went over there and you gave so much for this country and the country's like, Hey, pay up sucker. You know, <laughs> you know, like, you know, the, I feel like they get, they paid enough. You know, the people that actually fought, like they gave something, um, you know, whether you agree with the wars or not, the fact that they were willing to sacrifice what they sacrificed, I think, means a lot. And um, so up to the first hundred thousand earned and we could adjust that over time, you know, as, as inflation and everything else. But the first hundred thousand earned a year, I think, should be tax free for, for war veterans. And then um, after that, you know, then it'd be like normal. Right. I mean, if Jeff Bezos served in combat, I still would be taxing the piss out of him. Right. Sure. Yeah. Um, but I think that's a smart way to do it. And then on the other point on the on the pay. That was the night. So I think one of the primary things that we're missing, and I think it's pretty obvious when you really think about it, is accountability for, with Congress. We, we don't have any way to hold them accountable to what they do or don't do. They, uh, most districts are gerrymandered for one or the other party. So um, the party could literally take one Republican out and put another one in and they would win or, or do the same with the Democrat in most districts. Um, I think in 2016, before the presidential, before that, that election for Congress, um, Congress had like a 14% approval rating, but they only figured like 25 or 30 seats were up for grabs. I'm like, you got 435 seats. If you got a 14% approval rating, shouldn't, shouldn't there be like 400 seats up for grabs or something like that? Like, you know, 350 seats up for grabs. Like it should be a lot, but it's, you know, 30, like, you know, there's something wrong. And so I was just kind of brainstorming and trying to figure out a way to, to hold them accountable, you know, to, to make sure that they are accountable for what they, what they do, accountable to us, to the people they're supposed to represent. And that's where I, I came up with the idea of basing their pay on the median salary in their district, the median individual wage I'd like, to, like it to be, um, because then they won't get a raise until everybody else does, right? And so if they're doing their job, then they'll be doing well and they'll make more money. But if they're not doing their job and they're doing a really shitty job, you know, sorry. And I, and I also think there's a, a side benefit of that in like some of the poorer districts. If you think about like inner city districts and things like that, somebody who's a regular person, I think would do just fine um, on the regular pay that everybody makes in their, in their district. Right. But, but you're more likely to get an average person as your representative, which I think is important. It's important to have somebody who, who is the average in that area. You know, you, we, we always think about uh, these uh, Congress people and politicians as being somehow special or, or whatever, bigger and bad, you know, bigger or smarter and whatever. They're not, they're dumb as, they're dumb as you can imagine. So, um, you know, it's a matter of like also filling Congress with, with people that really are the people of, of their district that they actually, and they not just represent them, they are them. They are part of that, that group of people. And well, uh, I think that's really important. Yeah, and that uh, brings us to what's going on tonight, which is actually a few primaries going on across the country. An uh, exciting primary in New York, as well as in Kentucky, where kind of insurgent progressive candidates uh, 
Charles Booker looks like he's not going to uh, make it this time, unfortunately, losing out to the hand-picked Chuck Schumer candidate and Amy McGrath. Looks like it. Uh, and then Jamal Bowman looks like he has a chance in New York City, uh, kind of following the path of an AOC type, you know, Justice Democrat, insurgent, Democratic uh, candidate. Uh, what do you think about um, these kind of progressives that are trying to steer the Democratic Party in a more progressive direction and reform from within instead of from outside of the party? Uh, just as an independent, do you think that's a misguided effort? I do. I do. But I want to say one more thing on the last point, because I forgot to say this, which is um, as part of that, that basic pay on the median salary, I'm going to be donating my own pay above the median household wage in this district to teachers in the district, public school teachers, to reimburse them for supplies. So that's like, at current numbers, it's almost $100,000 a year I'll be giving out of my own pocket. So um, because I, I, I realize it'd be hard to pass this bill and I don't want to be a guy that's like, oh, well, they didn't pass it, doop, 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 but I just like take my money. <laughs> but, but yeah, so back to the question you just asked, um, I do believe it is a misguided effort and it's, it, it, it's honestly tough to say, like, I, I know that people get upset uh, about this, but the dynamic that I see that's happening and I've seen it for a long time and I, and I don't know a way around it while playing this game is that the, um, the Democrats, the party, like, you know, the, at the top, the, the, you know, the powerful people, they use progressive types like AOC or these types of people as a uh, street cred or window dressing. Like they want to put them out there and be like, look, this is us too. We're, we're also one of these things. We do this stuff. We, we, we like, we like the gays and the, and we like the, the income inequality and we like, you know, we like all these things, whatever it is. And uh, the point is, is that they, they, they use those people as window dressing. And then when it actually comes time to put policy together, they, they shut them out. They, they lock them out of the room. They don't let them in on the negotiations. You know, um, we've had two different, at least two different, maybe three different Democratic Congress people, you know, progressive types, um, write bills for that $2,000 a month UBI during this uh, pandemic, and Pelosi killed them, you know, so, uh, and one of them made it out of committee and everything, you know, and uh, I think it was Barbara Lee's and, and Pelosi killed it. So, um, you know, the the problem is, is that as long as you play this game, there are people in districts all across the country, which is the majority of districts that have Democrats representing them in Congress, the overwhelming majority um, are, are the centrist corporate Democrats. And I mean, we have in the Congressional Progressive Caucus, I, there are less than 100 people in that thing. And most of them are not progressives. I mean, Gil's in there. But he's not progressive. Uh, um, you know, Joe Kennedy's in there. Uh, like there's a lot of people in there that are not like it by any stretch of the imagination progressive. So you got to think that to meet half of Congress to, to, to pass a bill through the house, you need 218 votes. We don't even have a hundred progressives in the progressive caucus and most of them aren't even progressives. <laughs> so what are we trying to do? You know? And so, so they end up being able, all these other seats across the country that are, that are these corporate types, the, the voters will vote for these corporate types kind of by association, like, well, at least it's in the same party with AOC or it's in the same party with so-and-so. And I think that overall, I think it honestly hurts. It hurts the causes. It hurts. It stops us from moving forward and actually getting stuff done. I really believe that. Yeah, we were recently uh, speaking with Lisa Savage, who's run for the Senate uh, up in Maine, uh, which has ranked choice voting. Um, do you think that might be the solution that we need to kind of fill in the gaps and help the third party like the Greens or maybe the Libertarians. Uh, or, or Independents. Or Independents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I do. I think that that's the best, the best um, that they've proposed so far, but there are, there are also problems with it. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, but ultimately, like I'm a big advocate for, for election reform, like real election reform, um, because there's a few things that, like I had a pinned tweet thread on my Twitter for a while, and I, I still pull it up and, and post it. I, I changed it since the... Um, the George Floyd stuff a little bit because I was talking about police abuse for that pin tweet, but I have a, I had a pin tweet thread about, um, about elections and, you know, we don't have any real, um, transparency when it comes to our elections. You know, people are like, well, I checked online and my, my, my ballot was definitely counted. I'm like, yeah, okay. So you got your ballot counted, but how do you really know that the total is the total? How do you really know these things? You know, too. 
they brought in they brought in in LA County um, in my district, but in the LA County portion of my district, they brought in these machines where you you fill out a card and you put in your you know your, your who you're voting for, and then you put that into a machine. The machine spits out a QR code that you cannot read because you're not a computer. And then you take the QR code and you put it into another machine and then that takes your vote for you. And I'm like, why have the machine, like you had the card and you put the, th why is there machines after this? Why, why did we introduce machines, you know? But the, I, I mean, because the way I look at it is the oligarchs, the top of the thing, they, they, they already have the government working for them almost exclusively. Um, if you don't think that they would just go ahead and rig it outright, if they could, I think you're nuts. Because of course they would. What was I that think quote? Were, if uh, voting changed anything, they'd make it illegal, uh, illegal it. to Emma it, Goldman quote. Yeah, Emma Goldman. Yeah, Emma Goldman. And there's the other one I, I, I post every now and then. It's, uh, I think it was um, Stalin, but he said, I, I care not who, who casts the vote. He was talking about a vote inside the Communist Party, but he said, I, I care not who casts the vote. I only care who counts them. You know? Yeah, but, kind but, of sinister, I mean, but true. But it is true. And and the thing is, is, you know, it takes a lot more than, like, we should have trustless systems. It should be trustless. And by that, I mean, it should not require our trust to know that it was done properly, right? Every time that you have to, every time that anybody goes, oh, trust me, we got it. Mm -mm. Uh, that's a red flag to me. I don't like that at all. I don't care who it is. I don't care if I trust them or not. If my own mom said that, I'd be like, whoa, <laughs> hold on, ma. Hold on, let's go through this. You know, I gotta, I gotta see. So, you know, but that's a, it's a true thing. So um, I really think that they would rig it if they could. And I think that they very likely are, at least in the margins. Um, they definitely are in the Democratic primaries for presidency and stuff like that. Um, but, but even in the generals, I think that they are in the margins and things, manipulating numbers here and there. And, um, and you know, if we don't get a handle on that, none of the rest of it really matters. The, the, the ranked choice voting is a great idea um, but like it's only it's only good for so much like if you had 10 people on a ballot you would have to either have everybody rank all 10 or else their ballot is gone like you can't count it or at least nine of the 10 and you could assume the 10th right um, but you, uh, and then their ballot would be tossed out if they couldn't if they couldn't name them all or if you pick like a top three like rank your top three that does mess stuff up like from a purely mathematical position if one's position, if one person's position was either first or 10th on 50% of the ballots, but you don't get 10th voted because you only count the top three and they only rank the top three. And there was another person who would have been ranked fourth on everybody's ballot. The ranked fourth person would have won against the first and 10th place person. Right. And so, so that's, you know, how the averages work. And there are ways to calculate that, but they require computers. And when you start bringing in computers, <laughs> it starts getting weird. So, you know, I do think ranked choice voting is the best best system that we've come up with yet, but uh, it's not perfect either. You know, no matter what we need, we need exit polls. We need, um, you know, in-person voting at polling places. You know, this is stuff we absolutely have to have. Otherwise, uh, you can't trust what's actually going on, I don't think. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Steve Cox, thanks so much for joining us today. Is uh, is there a website where people can find out more about your platform or more about a potential run in the future? Yeah, um, my, my website, I'm, I'm in the process of rewriting it now, but it, it's uh, voteforcox.com. Um, you know, I'm, I'm Real Steve Cox on Twitter. I'm facebook.com slash Real Steve Cox on Facebook. I'm at Real Steve Cox on Instagram. I don't have a TikTok. I, I'm not sure. Uh, Me neither. I haven't, <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't opened it yet. I don't know what it does. <laughs> So, uh, but, um, I am 43 years old, you know, <laughs> uh, so I'm, you know, I don't have that yet, but that's all stuff that people can come to. Um, but you know what they really need to understand. And I mean, there's a lot of good resources on my website because it's got over 30,000 words of policy that I, I wrote myself, you know, source for data and, and, and all that stuff. And I think it's a good resource for people that want to pick, pick through and figure out what's even really going on. But, um, ultimately I, I just want people to understand that if I could get one message out there, it's that those people in those parties at the top, the, the big money interests, everything else, they don't care. They don't care about you. They don't. And they're never going to. They're never going to unless they have to. And you have to force them to, which means you have to, you have, to have something of leverage. You have to be, have a way 
to cause them to 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 pay attention to you and you know like we're seeing happening with a lot of the direct action and everything with police violence and and all that stuff that's that's the only way that it works you got to wrap somebody on the beard to get some respect you know so um i want people to understand that and in the meantime just understand that i'm a regular guy like anybody else but i am all i'm also a particular kind of asshole who i cannot wait to get in there because i'm going to make their lives hell in dc i am going to absolutely be up all their asses all the time because i i'm you know anytime they hold a vote for like we're going to make the official seed of the state or whatever, you know, the, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to just destroy these people. Cause you know, we got people starving. We got, we got people dying of, 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 uh, you know, lack of health insurance and wars going on everywhere. And they spend their time doing a bunch of useless bullshit. <laughs> I'm really tired. Of this. Yeah. Like we need a working thing. person's urgency in Congress for sure. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's exactly right. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Steve, thank you so much for your time. And we look forward to talking to you again. I appreciate you guys having me on. Thank you very much. Thanks, man. Have a good one. Yes, yeah. See ya.